Andrew Rannells is all over Netflix after appearing in Ryan Murphy's all-star adaptation of The Boys in the Band. He's now starring in The Prom as Juilliard grad Trent Oliver. In addition to being a power player of the stage and screen, he's also lent his talents to exciting work behind the camera. Hear about the ongoing Book of Mormon group chat, his surprising phone catch up with Patty Lapone, and more on this week's Show People. Mr. Rannells, so good to see you. It's good to see you. It's very good how, to see you. How you doing? How's life? I mean, I've seen you on the talk show circuit, which, you know, you're a pro at that. So I know you're fine and doing what you yeah. always do, but how are you really doing? How's your year been? Well, it's been, uh, it's been odd. You know, it's been a weird year. We finished filming the prom in March, right before the shutdown right. sort of happened. And I came back to New York to work on Modern Love for Amazon. And then that all um got shut down um so uh yeah i just felt like going from working basically every day for like nine months to then all of a sudden not doing anything uh, right. was a bit of an adjustment to say the least right. you're always doing something i mean i just feel like you're very uh ambitious and even when you're not acting you're writing and now you're directing i mean i just feel like you're a very creative person so when when everything just sort of stops when the yeah. big pause button gets pressed how how do you handle that mentally were you okay are you able to sort of say no. okay i can <laughs> no i wasn't okay i wasn't okay i think you know initially and i think maybe a lot of people had this response that like you know not knowing exactly how long this was going right. to go on for yeah. at first it was like okay we'll just take a little breather and as you know i did have writing projects to work on and i did have some things that i was doing at home but then you know as the months went on um it became very clear that like you know, there were going to be productive days and then there were going to be days that were not productive. Right. Um, and I would just watch Ozark in its entirety in one sitting. And, you know, watching 10 hours of television in one day is um, not the most productive way to spend your time. But, you know, there's also a, a, an element of like, we have to forgive ourselves, I guess, for having yeah. those bad days. Yeah. Um, so that, and I, you know, I'm an, I was very fortunate that I got to go back to work in September and then have, you know, been sort of working since then. Right. Um, cause New York has sort of figured out a way to, and Los Angeles too, but in, in New York, you know, figure out a way to have television productions come back in a safe and responsible way. So, you know, it's a lot of testing and it's a lot of, um, talking about protocol for safety and those things. Um, but, um, I'm happy that we figured out a way to, to get back into it. So a lot of swabs up the nostrils, lots of swabs, yeah. lots of swabs. And I took my first, um, at home test. Oh, yes. If you're familiar with the process of 23 and me or ancestry.com, yeah, yeah. it's a lot of spitting into a tube. Um, okay. yeah. So I did that. So I can add that to the list of new skills. <laughs> Get that on the resume. Get that uh, on there. <laughs> you're all over Netflix. You're all over Netflix. I love it. Uh, obviously, the Boys in the Band movie came out, which I thought was fantastic. I thought you were um, especially really incredible in it. Thank uh, you. Were you proud to get that out there and to have that sort of document of that amazing historic Broadway run? Yeah, I was I was most happy for Mart Crowley that we got yeah. to to do it again. And I think, you know, the amazing thing about doing that show on Broadway was having Mart be so um, present with us. He was around yeah. a lot um, and getting to see him, uh, you know, get the praise that he deserves for creating that show and creating that those characters and that story. Um, Cause you know, that, that, that piece had sort of a rocky history in terms of its initial reception in the sixties. And then sort right. of going through a time where, you know, it was not as well received and people thought, um, I think a lot of gay people thought it was a, a little too honest and a little too right. dark. And we were, you know, just in the early days of the gay pride movement. And it's a, it's a, it's a tricky story. It's a dark story yeah. about people struggling with a lot of things, but it's really honest and really beautiful. And I think that, um, yeah, I'm just, I, I was, I was most happy to, to have him see yeah. that people were, you know, were, we're seeing it with different eyes now. Yeah. I was very excited to meet Mark Crowley and now 
now that he's gone, I'm very disappointed that I didn't like get some good gossip because I just feel like that guy led a life. So when you meet uh, a, an elder gay like that, who's had a great life, did yeah. you, were you able to be like, okay, let's talk about Natalie Wood. Let's talk about yeah. all these things. And yeah, did you get any good stories? Yeah, I got lots of good stories. Um, uh, he was really, I mean, I think that, you know, the, some of them, uh, I don't know if you've ever feel this way when you talk to, you know, people who have those stories or you talk to people who are, you know, in the public eye and yeah. you sort of look at them like they're not quite human. So right, they're just right. like these icons that are there that, you know, we don't really have a personal relationship with. So the thing that I learned most about talking with him specifically about Natalie Wood was that Natalie Wood was his best friend and yeah. she's not was not just some actress in the newspaper that, you know, had this horrible uh, death happened to her. Like yeah. that was his friend. So right. it was a good reminder to be like, don't ask like stupid questions <laughs> because, right, right, right. because that was a human being. That was a yeah. human being. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was, it was, uh, that was a good reminder, but he had great, I mean, he was very patient with me. I asked a lot of questions about heart to heart, which he ran for, you know, many years. Um, so I had uh, many questions about Stephanie Powers and Robert Wagner. And, um, <laughs> yeah. and he was very patient with answering all of those questions. Heart to heart. That was like such a, that was so iconic during my childhood. Where's that reboot? Where's the heart to heart reboot? <sighs> I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying. There's actually, there's a, there's a photo, there's photographic evidence of this where I, at the opening night of Boys in the Band, Robert Wagner was there. Uh -huh. And and I said to him, I was like, I am trying to do a a gay reboot of Heart to Heart, where it's a Amazing. gay couple, and his face sort of contorts in a strange way. And then there's a photo of it <laughs> of him listening to this idea, and he was like, Oh, okay. And I was like, I would be Stephanie Powers, and he was like, Sure, <laughs> sure, okay. Okay, but I, I I'm trying. I feel like you do need a show like that. I could totally picture you like in fabulous locales and solving. Yes. What, what were they doing? They were solving mysteries. What were they doing? I don't even. They remember. were solving there were so mysteries. Shows. Yeah, he was a he was a novelist, and she was okay. just like this fabulous socialite. Right. And somehow they started solving crimes. Okay. Um, cool. Yeah. And Ryan Murphy hasn't bit. You haven't gotten him excited about this. I, I again, I'm trying. I'm trying okay, my best. Okay. You keep working on that. Yeah. You know, speaking of uh, it, one of the big things I think about probably uh, being in your position at this point in your career is what you kind of what you said about Natalie Wood, which is when you get to meet people as real people, um, you know, and when you grow up, everyone's sort of like this the starry icon. And then when you actually interact with people and you sort of see them struggling with life, just like you do. I mean, I've had a lot of interactions within the last year with, you know, very uh, established people from my childhood. And then you kind of see them just struggling with the pandemic, like everyone is. Yeah. Um, so that makes me think of being on the set of the prom because wow, you got a lot of stars in that movie with you. <laughs> it was a lot of starry people. Um, but that was like the big, um, I think, realization when we were in rehearsals was that they're just people. So when we were learning all of that choreography and seeing, you know, Meryl and Nicole really like dive into it just like the rest of us were. And there was no, you know, they had to, they were working their asses off learning all of this choreography and so was i like here we all are so we had a really kind of traditional musical theater rehearsal that i think that's the time where the cast really bonds and so in yeah. a lot of ways by the time we got to set it felt like we were already a team and we were already a pretty tight group and the sort of intimidation factor um eventually wore off but it was an adjustment certainly do you have any favorite Meryl Streep movies or moments from that amazing career? Like what jumps out to you? Well, I mean, all of the, you know, I tortured her with so many questions about so many things. Um, you know, Sophie's Choice and Out of Africa and the French Lieutenant's Woman and like asking her all sorts of questions about that. But then also got into like Death Becomes Her and She Devil. And, yeah. um, you know, I really, I got in there. <laughs> and, got she, in there. Again, and she again very patient very patient <laughs> she's used to the she's used to a fanboy well and i tried to sort of like pull back sometimes and be like just relax but um but we talked about uh, you know that was the thing we spent hours and hours together on the set that like we had a lot of downtime and the thing that i was really 
struck by on the first day that sometimes when you're when you're filming something and they say cut all of the actors sort of scatter and oftentimes you know people go back to their dressing rooms or their trailers or whatever but nicole and meryl just sat with us like oh, they wow. just they sat down in these chairs and um asked questions and you know got to know each other and and meryl and james and nicole and i really spent a lot of time just like chatting about stuff um and not movie stuff just like life stuff which was yeah. um which was really nice I love that. I'm a big fan of the prom on Broadway and a big fan of the movie now. And they're different, obviously. And, you know, the yeah. movie got to expand on a lot of um, sort of backstories, right? We got to sort yeah. of learn a little bit more about some of the characters. But I was really happy to see, you know, that not much was really lost, you know? I mean, like, you know, the score is pretty much intact. And uh, that was exciting as a fan because I was sort of nervous to see what. Yeah what would gonna come out of it. I mean, when, when the one of the biggest changes is that your character, Trent, goes from being a cater waiter to a bartender. That's about as severe as the changes get. <laughs> yeah, and I got to dance in a mall. In a uh, mall. Versus right. a parking lot. No, Ryan, I think Ryan Murphy loved the show and yeah. loved the message and didn't want to mess with it too much. But he's so, he has such a good eye for those things, obviously, of like when to expand and when not to expand. And introducing yeah. Tracy Ullman's character as as yeah, James's yeah. mother, I think, was it was such a you know a, a necessary and a really smart move. Um, and we had that leeway in the film that you know they you can't really get into in a Broadway show all the time, but we had the opportunity. So I think Ryan was very um, very wise in what he chose to expand and what he just yeah. left the same. Yeah, so let's talk about filming in a mall. Um, yeah. You do an entire number in a mall. Uh, it, it looks like there were bystanders. Were there actually yeah. like regular people just sort of like shopping who were like, oh, yeah. they're filming a musical number over there? Yeah, we had this mall in Northridge, California that um, we obviously had a huge chunk of it sort of for us. But the reality was the mall was still open. Right. Um, and this was in February, I guess. Okay. So people people were still just shopping. Um, so yes, you will see people who are just like, what's happening down there? Um, what are they doing? Who is that person yelling? Um, so it was fun, it was fun to do. We had about, I think, three days filming that wow. number. Yeah. Wow. You're going to be very famous in that mall. Although it looks like any mall anywhere. I mean, it just looks. <laughs> yeah, it's a mall. I mean, it, you know, we were, we were supposed to be in Indiana, obviously, but like it right. looked like malls in Nebraska too. So I was like, sure. this seems sure. right. Yeah. Sure. Uh, Trent is uh, super pretentious. Um, we all, the you know, the big running joke is that he went to Juilliard and he loves to remind people that he went to Juilliard. Um that doesn't seem like you at all. That's not, uh, that, I mean, I, I, you're not that guy. Uh, you did not go to Juilliard. No, I went to Marymount Manhattan, but oh. I dropped out after like two years, so. so you, right, so you went to Marymount and then you got work, basically. Yes. You started I, like working. I started working, yeah. And you're like, I'm gonna do that instead. I'm gonna work. I'm gonna work yeah. instead of study about how to work. So did you ever uh, deal with anyone like Trent? You must have, I mean, there, yeah. there are, this is a real thing, I mean. Yeah, no, I dated a guy who went to Juilliard for, I dated him for many years and he was a Juilliard grad and um, it would get, it would slip into conversation more often than one might think. Um, and the, the, the thing that we didn't, I improvised it a lot and it didn't make it into the film was like the specificity of um, group number because you don't say year at Juilliard, you say what group you were in. Right. I was in group totally, totally. 40, I was in group 26. I was in group right. 41. And so that's how they that's how right. they slip it in is that oh my group number and you're like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, well at Juilliard we do group numbers. So I kept trying to get that in, but um I think it was a little too inside baseball um for to make it in there. But um I mean I remember <laughs> when um years ago we were filming an episode of of girls and patty lapone was on the show and she was playing herself group, group one group one group one she was group yeah. one and <laughs> i um we, it was a lot of improvising on that show and yeah. jenny connor the showrunner was like okay this is your moment Reynolds. like you can ask any question to patty lapone about patty lapone in the safety of this show. Right. So I launched into, I, and I don't think it's in the episode, but I was like, who else was in group one? And Patty, like, she like was shocked. She was like, well, 
Uh, and then she like talked about it, but she was so, and she was like, you know the lingo. And I was like, oh, I know the lingo. Oh, I know. <laughs> what would that little kid growing up in Omaha think that like, you now know Patty Lapone and you know, you're in a movie with Meryl Streep. And I mean, it's crazy. Look at it's your crazy. life. It's crazy. Uh, it's certainly not anything I expected. And I think, um, yeah, it's crazy. It's a, it's a lot of pinch me moments, um, particularly doing this, but like, you know, and I, I don't know if uh, maybe you've had the similar experience of like, I feel like during this pandemic, um, while we're all very isolated, I have developed different relationships with people mm -hmm. just over the phone, um, mm -hmm. calling more people than I am used to. And, and one night I was sitting in this room, like by myself watching TV and Patty Lapone called me <laughs> just to mm -hmm. like, check in and see how I was doing. Um, and there's been a few of those phone calls and it was so sweet that like, as you said, like everybody's in the same boat. It's not like, you know, anyone in, is spared from this. So the fact that, you know, Patty Lapone and I had a conversation about like, well, this sucks, um, was, <laughs> was really great, was really great. Right. I love that you are writing so much. I loved your, your memoirs. Uh, you're such a fantastic writer. Thank you. Um, and I love that you, you've shared so much about, about your life and about sort of uh, your history and sort of what got you to this place. What, was there anything that was hard to share? What was like the hardest thing to sort of open up about and tell people um, about your life? Uh, um, well, I felt like if I was going to do it, I didn't want to pull any punches or talk around mm -hmm. anything or ignore anything. So the hardest part, I guess, was like, I, I had a pretty easy coming out in terms of being accepted by my family and being accepted by my friends. But right. I had a very difficult um, early sexual relationship with someone that was, right. um, you know, was really hard. And it was yeah. um, something that I hadn't really dealt with as an adult. And then through writing that book and having to talk about it and having to be so honest about it and, and really going back to that time, um, that was hard. And also knowing that my family was going to read it, my mother was going to read right. it and, that they're, you know, if for as loving and accepting as they were, there are just certain things that you can't protect your kids from. So that was, that was tough. That was hard. And I also, you know, I wasn't in a place at that time at 17 to share what was happening with my family. So then as yeah. a 40 year old, I yeah. got to say like, this is actually what was going on. And that was hard. That was a hard thing. But I feel like if I, you know, when I was promoting the book and traveling around the country, you know, doing readings and, and, and yeah. things. Um, a lot of people had similar stories to that and a lot of young people. And so it made me feel like, okay, well, I shared it and it wasn't just in vain and it wasn't just me sort of spinning my wheels and talking about things like that didn't apply to anyone else. Like those, there, there were actually young people who were going through very similar things. And, um, you know, the fact that I, was able to say to those people, like, there's an out, there's a way to get out of this. There's a, you know, you can change the course of what's happening right now. Um, that meant a lot to me to hear those stories. And your modern love column, which I, I love a, the Amazon series of modern love. I loved season one and you are now directing, right? Episode yeah. 202. 202. Uh, and it's a, it's an episode, ba the entire series is based on different New York Times modern love columns and you wrote one. So you got to direct uh, your story, yeah, right? right? Yeah. What was it like actually watching that play out? Or did you feel like, were you able to sort of feel removed from it? A little bit of both. I mean, I, I really pushed um, to be included in that second season. I was a huge fan of the first season. Yeah. And so I reached out and was like, if you're considering essays, I would love to be considered. And they, um, said, well, you know, take a whack at adapting it. And the nice thing was John Carney, the, the showrunner, I had a conversation with him and he was like, it doesn't have to be your exact story. It, it right. should be the essence of that essay, um, but it doesn't have to be, you know, the Andrew Reynolds story. You can open it up and you can change things. And so that was really freeing and sort of forgiving that I didn't have to write step by step what happened in that essay. I was kind of able to expand it a little bit. And then yes, like casting other actors and having other people do it. Um, I did feel 
a little removed from the storytelling. But it was, I mean, you know, my best friend Susanna Shukowski was in the episode, and Nikki James is in the episode, and Catherine Gallagher is in the episode. So I also had, you know, people who I'm really friends with playing these characters' friends. Um, cool. So that was a little trippy, but um, but they were also great. And the the two actors that were cast in it, Zane Pace and Marquise Rodriguez, were um, just fantastic. And I think, uh, yeah, just really made it their own in a way that it should be not like they were trying to play me or anything. So that was right. nice. So do you see this as a, a new career direction? I mean, do you want to do more of this? Do you want to be more behind the camera? I'm kind of curious about, you know, what, what we're going to be seeing from you in the next 20 or 30 years. Do you have like a really interesting career? You've done so many interesting things since uh, debuting on Broadway. And I'm kind of, did you enjoy it? Did you love that experience? Yeah, I did. I mean, it was very specific. It was a, yeah. you know, it was a story that I wrote um, that I got to, you know, create and that I directed. So it sort of felt like doing like a short film rather mm. than stepping into right. an episodic series that I feel like is a very, a very different skill. And I, I marvel at directors that have, you know, step into black Monday or come on to girls yeah. and just, you know, jump in and do it. Um, but I certainly would like to do more of it. Um, but that, but the modern love thing was was a, a real gift because it was very specific, um, mm -hmm. the way that it was all handled. So, um, yeah, I'd like to. I'm, I'm certainly I'm writing a lot right now, and um, so we'll see what happens. I feel like I stopped doing the vision board thing uh, around the time of the Book of Mormon because um, I realized that that I couldn't have foreseen that happening. Like that was not. I couldn't have predicted that. So I think. Uh, I'm just kind of taking things as they come and opportunities, even, you know, with, with, with directing and with writing, like that all just sort of came about. I didn't ever think like, Oh, I'm going to write a book. Um, right. But certain things fell in line and um, then all of a sudden I was writing a book and, uh, and not that I'm just like sitting here and like letting things happen to me, but like, right. I think that the sort of white knuckling of like, and now I'll do this like that mm -hmm. always backfires on me. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I have to, um, I think you just have to be as prepared as possible to receive opportunity. And I'm lucky to be in a position right now that I do get to choose more than I ever thought I would right. get to choose. So, you know, you can say no to things, which is not something, you know, especially as a young actor, you often have the luxury of saying no, you just have to take the job. Um, so uh, yeah, so I feel very grateful for that, that I'm actually I'm able to sort of seek things out in a different way. But um, I'm just trying to stay open to possibility right now. Mm -hmm. You know, next spring will be the 10th anniversary of Book of Mormon, right? So, yes, so it will. You, is there any big party happening? Is there a Zoom party? I'm sure Josh Gad will have a Zoom party or something. Doesn't he do that? He does reunions. Uh, yeah, <laughs> he does the reunions. Yeah, I'm sure there'll be something. I mean, you know, unfortunately, I don't think that Broadway will be in a space to, right. you know, there was talk about a concert, there was talk right. about, you know, doing something like that. I We're not going to be there in March. I don't, I can't imagine. No. Yeah. Um, so whatever that celebration will be, uh, will be delayed a little bit. But we've all stayed very close, I will say. Um, and there is, you know, an ongoing, you know, this is almost year 10 of like an ongoing group chat um, mm -hmm. that we're all still a part of, which is, um, which is really unique. And that's not something that, you know, I've, I've experienced with a lot of shows. I mean, smaller ones, certainly, you know, I'm still very close with all of those falsettos uh, people. Sure. Um, but, um, but the Book of Mormon was a big show. And the fact that we yeah. all still keep in touch is, um, I think that speaks to the experience and how grateful we all were to be a part of it. It was, nobody could have predicted that it was going to be the hit that it was, but we were all a little bit older. Like we weren't all in our twenties, we were right. in our thirties. Right. And I think that was the big difference is that everybody realized this doesn't come around all the time. This isn't right. just a normal occurrence. So everyone was, there was a lot of gratitude in that group, um, which is sometimes unusual working with right. young actors, you know, right, that sometimes right, people right. take it for granted. But I'm sure 10 years ago, you know, Christmas 2010, you must have just been like itching. I mean, you know, the buildup of that show, uh, you know, you had landed a, a great leading role. 
Um, and the show, I remember when the show was in workshop, everyone was just sort of like, oh my God, you're not ready. This is crazy. You had to like sign all sorts of like legal yes. document, right? You couldn't talk yes. about what was in the show. I mean, yeah. it was, it was such a unique experience, but yeah. you know, if you think back to that guy, I mean, it's just that that was literally right before everything sort of exploded. Well, the, the interesting, the reality of doing a Broadway show is that you're doing it eight times a week and that there is no sort of relaxing. You have right. to always right. do the show. So it's not like we did a movie and then like months later, we're right. trying not to talk about it. Like we still had to do the show every night. So for all of the crazy things that were sort of swirling around all of us and all of the opportunity and all of the sort of noise about the show, we still had to go to the theater every night and just do yeah. the show which I yeah. feel like is, is, you know, the most grounding thing um, you could be a part of. So mm -hmm. um, I think that's what kept everybody sort of level. Do you think that the Book of Mormon could be a movie? There was definitely talk about it yeah. um, and several different versions of it. Mm -hmm. But I think what was, is remarkable about Trey and Matt and Bobby is that they, they set out to make a Broadway show and Trey has said in the past that like, you know, turning it into something else, particularly that show, like, yeah. I don't, I don't know how it translates necessarily to film. And, you know, there was a real make believe quality to a lot of that. It was not super realistic that we were in Uganda. It was not. So then to drop us there, I think it loses some of the comedy because then you're confronted with the reality of, what that is and you right. can't really comment it, on it in the right. same way. So, right. um, yeah, so I don't, I don't know. I, got, I don't know is the short answer. Maybe animated and then you could be animated. Could play, you could play Elder Price forever. You could. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, was on Jimmy Fallon the other night and, uh, uh did like a medley of Broadway songs and it ended with, I believe. And I know they just sort of, you know, took for great. They were like, well, you can still sing that. Right. And I was like, honestly, I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't know if I can still sing it, but yeah, I tried. I tried my best. Are, are there any other uh, movie musicals you would like to ex to do or explore? I, I've always dreamt of a falsettos movie musical. I don't. Me I don't... too. That is another show that's like really grounded in this sort of middle world of reality. Yeah. Um, so it would it would be hard to to figure out how to adapt it. But if anybody could do it, it'd be James the Pine. Like he would figure out a way to do it. So I think that would be, I would love to try to do that. Yeah, will you work on that please? I, I, sure. I need that. I need I need to cry at falsettos at home. The <laughs> film they did of it for the movie theaters was fantastic actually. Yeah, no, I was really happy that we got to uh, to film that for, for PBS because that was, I mean, that was how I sort of fell in love with musical theater was Into the Woods and Sunday in the Park with George mm. and Sweeney Todd and, that recording of Pippin that exists, like that's how I in the Midwest like, got to see those shows. Um, right. So to get to be a little piece of that history of, you know, having that in the canon of PBS um, films um, felt really, you know, I was really proud of that. All you needed was Bernadette Peters to sweep in and it would make it like a real childhood PBS experience. <laughs> or Daniel Furlan. Daniel Furlan was your... <laughs> The other <laughs> constant. <laughs> yes, it's true. It's very Bernadette true. Bernadette and Danielle as the lesbians from next door. There you they go. They could do it. They could uh, do it. <laughs> so uh, here we are. We made it through a year. Uh, are you excited for the holidays and sort of turning the, the page on the calendar? And what what are you sort of looking at for 2021? Everything's going to be better, right? Well, I, everything's going to be solved. I know. I feel, yes, there's obviously a lot of optimism and a lot of hope going into this uh, to this new year. But I think I'm trying to temper that with like a, a, a you know, a modicum of reality that uh, it's not going to change on the second. You know, it's not going to be. No. And here we are. Um, but I think that, you know, everybody uh, is trying their best to adapt. I think the holidays are going to be, you know, obviously very different. Not being able to see my family and um, travel for the holidays is, um, that's tough. Um, but, you know, even like I was terrified to tell my mother I wasn't coming home for Christmas. But she was like, well, of course you can't come home for Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> like, you can't get on a plane right now. Yeah. Um so it was nice that everybody at least was on the same page about that. So we're trying our best. I'm most optimistic for whenever it happens for Broadway to come back. 
Um, and I don't know what that's going to look like or what that is going to take exactly, but hearing about shows making those plans is, um, is very optimistic because, you know, we, we have a ton of friends who have just been completely unrooted, uh, by the fact that, you know, those theaters can't reopen. So, um, yeah, so that's the thing that I'm most looking forward to is figuring out a way to come back. And be on Broadway. Do you want to be and on, be on Broadway? Broadway? Oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And if nothing yeah. else, just to see a Broadway show. Like, that's, I really miss that, like coming back to New York and not having that option. Um, you know, it feels like a piece of the city is missing. I think a lot about sort of like the lingering effects. I think there will be long lasting effects from this, obviously. And it's not, it's never going to just like snap back yeah. to, and here we are again. But the thing that I'm, I, I'm hopeful for is that we, I feel like people are, are checking in on each other in a way that is really nice. And I yeah. hope that that continues. I hope that that continues. Keep checking in on everybody. Yeah. Um, Keep calling me, Patty. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so the prom is very exciting. This will be hopefully a big holiday event for everyone. You know, it's it's very easy when you've been out of the closet for many years to sort of take things like this for granted. But the fact yeah. that something like that exists, if you think of teenage Andrew, Andy, Andy, were you ever Andy? Andy? I was Andy. Andy. Yeah. Teenage, yeah. teenage Andy, and I I heard about your prom date, but yeah. uh, you know. But, you know, just thinking about uh, this being out there. Yeah, I think that, you know, obviously we've we've come a long ways. It was interesting being a part of Boys in the Band and then being a part of the prom a few months later because those men in 1968 were sort of really boxed into this idea that they couldn't be honest. And the only way they could be themselves was to lock themselves in this apartment. <laughs> and that's when they could be free. But even that, there was a, a fair level of risk involved in that if uh you know somebody called the police because these gay guys were having a loud party like they could all go to jail so right. th the fact that um you know then a few months later i'm telling the story about this girl out and proud in high school and taking yeah. up her girlfriend to the prom um it does you know it was a, a very stark reminder of how far we've come but you know that but her coming out that character emma um played by Joellen Pellman, um, really beautifully. She doesn't have the easiest coming out. So some things have changed, but you know, in other ways, not a lot. But you literally went from doing a movie about a bunch of guys who could get arrested for having a loud party to a movie that literally ends with a big gay loud party. <laughs> yes. I mean, the uh, biggest, I mean yeah. Like just, yeah. just the gayest prom imaginable. <laughs> yeah, the gayest prom yeah. imaginable. Well, I hope that I get to see you in person at a big gay party soon. I know. I would um, love that. I hope you have a great holiday and I Thank and everyone you needs too. to check out the prom and they can still check out Boys in the Band. This is a great thing about Netflix. You just keep watching these things forever and Modern Love next year. There's all kinds of things happening for you. And Big you, Mouth is out Big now. Mouth, on and then another season, you're going to start another season of Black Monday, right? I mean, yep, yep, that's right. There's a lot of Andrew Randall's to go around. I'm into it. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Paul. Thanks.